We're back at Title Gardens outside of Akron, Ohio, Copley to be exact, with Fan Thane. Fan 5,000 gallons. Your tanks are immaculate, but they're not always that way. Give us the nuts and bolts of what goes on behind the scenes here. Sure. So uh, when it comes to maintenance, we try to keep things as simple as possible. And originally, what I had set up was kind of an automatic water change system. So you just turn a couple knobs, and the tanks would drain, fill back up with new salt water. But what we found over time is that nothing really replaces just good old elbow grease. And so we're very, very active when it comes to uh, just aggressive removal of all the little crud at the bottom of tanks called detritus. And uh, outside of that, we run very, very large protein skimmers like this guy here. This is uh, an RK2 protein skimmer, which is very popular in, the, uh, in uh, public aquariums and whatnot. And this guy's nice just because of his immense size, but also they have spray down jets and everything. So it's a pretty cool toy if you're into that sort of thing. Does it work out well because it's like dead center in the middle of the greenhouse? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, I think that as long as there's enough water flow going through the entire system, there's enough water flow and turnover going through filtration equipment like this. Then, so you got this in the middle of the greenhouse, but you also have a bunch of gadgets and knobs and hoses that we need to go look at. Sure, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Then you can't have a marine system without having gadgets and knobs and hoses and pipes, right? Right. So this thing here is our heating and cooling system. This thing provides heat directly to the floor and directly to the tanks. It's a, it's a tankless hot water heater made by Renai here. And uh, the red tubes that you see are the actual heating tubes that go into the floor. Now, in the wintertime, like I said, it pumps in hot water to both the floor and to the tanks. However, in the, in the summertime, we run uh, cold water geothermally through the, the same system uh, to provide cooling. I'm taking it that you didn't hook all this up. No, this is a professional plumber land. Nice. So everybody watching at home, this is what you need to have a 5,000 gallon system under a greenhouse. Absolutely. This is, this is my favorite thing in this whole place. Fan, all this talk about maintenance and hoses and pipes and gadgets has got me worn out. I want to focus on what Tidal Gardens is, and that's dealing with corals. In this display, you have a whole bunch of corals that are lined up, almost look like they're on a shelf being ready to be sold. What are they? So all of our, our uh, corals are mounted on basically these plugs. And it's more for our organization than anything else. Uh, because we used to, to, uh, to glue them directly to uh, like natural coral substrate. But when it comes to organization, it's just not feasible to do it on this scale. So we ended up using uh, these, these types of plugs to, to have it a lot more organized. Now, they're not the most natural looking things, obviously. So a lot of times, um, once a, a hobbyist gets a hold of one of these corals, they'll actually remove it from the plug and remount it themselves to something that looks more natural. How are they glued on? And then how do they remove them? Do they have to remove them with a razor? Do you cut them? How do you remove them? So they're actually glued on with regular super glue, like the stuff that you'd find at a hardware store. They're actually fairly simple to just to, to pop off with like a screwdriver or whatnot. Is it when you put one onto a natural substance or substrate, do you have to glue it back on or can you find a place where maybe it's just leaning against it, just enough to touch it? Most of the time I would recommend gluing it on, but if you found like a low flow area where you can kind of just wedge it into it like a natural piece of rock, nine times out of ten, that particular coral will eventually encrust onto that rock. Ben, you make it sound so easy, cutting and pasting and gluing. Is there ever a time when it's not as easy? Sure. There's actually some, uh, some health risks to some of these corals. In particular, we have a, a type of coral called a zoanthid that uh, actually contains one of the most potent neurotoxins known to man. And if that gets into your circulatory system, it can pretty much end you. So I'm sure you have some on display. I'm just going to stand about 10 feet back while you talk about them. <laughs> sure, let's go take a look. Then we talk about how easy it is to propagate corals. But you were telling us just a second ago that there are some issues with a couple of species. Absolutely. So in this tank here, the vast majority are either zoanthids or paleothoa. And they contain a, a compound called paleotoxin, which is a very, very, very potent neurotoxin. And um, one little interesting tidbit around this stuff is that uh, Polynesian warriors would actually sharpen their spears or actually just scrape these guys up and use it as a form of bioweaponry before they go to, off to battle. So there is obviously an issue when cutting them and propagating them. 
how do you do it? Obviously, you got to wear gloves and you got to be very careful. Yeah, you just have to exercise extreme care whenever handling these things. When you talk about propagating, is there a difference between propagating and cutting them than cleaning your tank and maybe running your hand across it? Yes, absolutely. So um, when it comes to propagating, you're, you're physically damaging the flesh and that's what can cause the exposure to paleotoxin. So for general maintenance, cleaning glass and whatnot, you really don't have a very serious risk of any kind of toxin poisoning. Than, if there is an ounce of danger to these, why would a hobbyist keep them? I think it's a situation where the aesthetics kind of overrides the safety concerns. Um, ironically, zoanthids and paleothoa are arguably the most popular types of corals to get into. Um, they are relatively easy to care for, so they're beginner friendly in that, in that regard. And also, they come in such a wide variety of colors and patterns that they're very, very appealing in the hobby. So if you don't necessarily propagate them yourself, or at least you know the issues with them, and you're not doing any skeletal damage putting it in your tank, you should be okay. Yes, absolutely. Fan, Tuttle Gardens, 5,000 gallons, fantastic coral. But you're not a big fan of starting a tank, a marine tank, with live rock. No, I'm really not. And this is kind of where I diverge from a lot of other popular opinion on it. It's because I, th I really think that the benefits of live rock are greatly outweighed by some of the concerns of introducing some really undesirable hitchhikers. Like the, the main benefits of live rock are the bacteria, like the, the nitrifying bacteria, as well as some of the beneficial creepy crawlies that, that help break down nutrient. Um, but all of those things will eventually populate like a piece of dead rock that, that you're holding there. Um, it takes a little bit longer, but you don't run the same risk of introducing um, like some kind of crab that might eat coral. So starting with dead rock might take a little longer, but in the long run, it's probably going to save you some heartache and problems. Absolutely, because once it comes time that once you realize that you have a major pest issue, then you have to pretty much remove all the rock from your system anyway and try to try to get the root cause and it's a miserable experience. You know, I, I learned in doing this show a long time ago that one of the sayings is nothing happens in a marine tank good fast. It takes a while. Exactly. There's, uh, there is no substitute for patience in this hobby. Dan, you may not carry live rock for people, but you've got a great amount of corals for them to look at. All they got to do is go to Tidal Gardens, Dot com and they can see everything that we've just talked about. Absolutely, just check us out online. A tropical paradise in the middle of Ohio, Copley, Ohio that is. Blue Zoo TV, presented by Hikari, featuring Bluebell. Blue Zoo TV is presented by Hikari, all fish love Hikari, and featured by Bluebell, a Rolf C. Hagen company. Blue Zoo TV is partnered with Carib C, bringing science to life. Cordon, trusted solutions since 1961, and EcoBioBlock by Wondersave Products. To email the show, go to bluezootv.com and follow us on Twitter at bluezootv.